So I'm going to present my recent work on studying generalization in deep learning via pack base. And this is joint work with my colleagues at University of Toronto, so Daniel Roy and Kyle Xu, and also my colleague at LMTI, Wasim Grabe. So stochastic gradient descent and its variants are widely used in practice, yet its generalization properties are still poorly understood. And there are a number of approaches that one can take. In this talk, I'll present an approach based on pack basing and framework. So pack-based bound, pack yields bounds on average risk for the weight sample from some data-dependent distribution queue. And in order to study stochastic gradient descent, we need the posterior queue to be concentrated near a HD solution. So in order to um, de-randomize the bounds and actually get the bound on the deterministic classifier of HD rather than this randomized classifier queue. Generalization near bound is then determined by the KL divergence between Q and some fixed prior P. Now, the prior P here is not a Bayesian prior, and the word prior mostly refers to the fact that the prior is evaluated on the data that was not used to evaluate the bound itself. So empirically, existing bounds are numerically vacuous for numerous reasons, and almost all applications suffer from a large KL divergence on the count of the bad choice of this prior P. So in a lot of my recent work, and what I'll be presenting in this talk, is um, I'll focus on the role of the prior P and the pack-based bounds. So I'll start by reviewing the pack-based framework for generalization bounds. I'll introduce them three principles for studying generalization using pack-based framework. I'll describe their application to computing crisp bounds on these randomized class classifiers Q that are concentrated near HD solution. And I'll show how the same ideas can be used can be applied to self-bounded learning. So pack-based bounds, pack-based um, framework is for yielding bounds on Gibbs classifiers, so on randomized classifiers that I'll define in a moment. Uh, let me start by introducing some notation first. So let H be the weight space, our hypothesis page, space. Let L be our loss function that maps hypothesis and training data to an interval of zero and one. Then the risk is the expected loss, and the empirical risk is just the average of losses average over our training data. Then a Gibbs classifier is a probability distribution of our H. And the risk of this Gibbs classifier, Q, is defined to be the average risk under samples from Q. So risk of Q is the expected, um, the expected risk where the expectation is taken over the, um, our, our randomized classifier, Q. Uh, which can be rewritten as, as this double expectation, where first we sample a training point, then we sample a hypothesis from Q and evaluate our loss. So there are many pack based theorems, and the particular one that I'm presenting is due to Cotoni. For the remainder of the talk, we'll be dealing with a bound of loss function, so uh, loss functions to see bounded between zero and one. So first, nature chooses a data distribution D. Then we choose a distribution P on weights that we'll call the prior. Then the nature gives us a data set S, sampled ID from some unknown data distribution. Now we know the empirical risk surface. So in this particular example, we have two different minima. One minima is quite wide, and another minima is you know, quite narrow on the other side. Uh, then pack these bounds tell, uh, gives us a guarantee on the risk of the randomized classifier Q. So for any randomized classifier Q, the risk of Q is separate bounded in terms of its empirical risk plus this term that depends on the KL divergence. So in our example, the toy example here on the right, we could center a posterior classifier Q uh, near this wide, large minima. And uh, the variance of Q can be pretty large, and we will still have a pretty small empirical risk term. And the KL divergence between Q and P that will then determine the, the, the tightness of the bound. Alternatively, we could center our posterior classifier Q prime in this uh, narrow minima region, then Q prime has to be highly concentrated, not incur too much of this additional um, training error that appears here in the bound. And what pack these bounds tells us that the guarantee that we'll get for Q prime is much looser than the guarantee we'll get for Q, because the KLQ prime at P will be much larger than KLQ in P. So if there are any questions about the pack base framework, please feel free to interrupt me, because it will be kind of the center of the talk. So pack -based, um, this pack-based bounds can be rewritten as bounding the square difference between risk and empirical risk of Q in terms of the KL divergence. And in fact, pack-based bounds uh, can be proved 
proven for any complex function of uh, empirical risk and risk of Q and binded above in terms of KL divergence between Q and P. Now, just to remind you, kind of my original goal was to uh, get some guarantees or to improve our understanding of generalization of HD. And pack based bounds yield bounds for Gibbs classifiers, so randomized classifiers. And there is a growing literature and techniques to construct pack based bounds on deterministic classifiers. One such approach exploits margin to de-randomize. So this is an old idea that was initially applied in the setting of SVMs. And more recently, it was studied, um, there are new bounds by Nishibar et al. and Nagarajan and Coulter. So this particular bound that I'm presenting is um, by Nishibar et al. From, last, from this year, actually. So first fix a margin gamma and some confidence parameter delta. Um, then for each classifier H, let Q be a distribution on, on our hypothesis space. Um, and assume that the following guarantee holds. So with probability greater than a half, we want the, um, the outputs of the neural network in the worst case scenario not to change too much. So this, the, the worst case change in the output is bounded above by in terms of gamma. Then with high probability, we get a bound on the risk of the deterministic classifier Q rather than the randomized classifier uh, Q. So the, the risk of H, sorry, is upper bounded in terms of the empirical um, margin loss of H plus inflated KL divergence term. So here we started with these random, uh, randomized classifier risk bounds. And if you know, the following conditions hold, we actually get a bound on the deterministic classifier. So we de-randomize the bound. So this was just one such approach, very many others. So for example, there are approaches based on disintegrated versions of pack base or other approaches combine pack based engineering training ideas. So consider a pack based plus margin approach to bounding HD risk. Now, in order to de-randomize, we need the posterior Q to be tightly concentrated around weights learned by stochastic gradient descent. And in order to control the KL complexity term, we need the prior P to have sufficient mass near HD solution. Now, this is hard to achieve both at the same time without knowing the training data or at least the data distribution D. But in fact, the prior can depend on the data distribution in the, in the spike based bound. So this theorem due to Cotoni from 2007 and Langford had similar results, says that the optimal prior P, so fix, first start by fixing a posterior classifier Q, then the optimal prior P that minimizes the pack based risk bound equals to the expectation of Q where the expectation is taken over the training data. If we evaluate the KL divergence term with this optimal prior P, we get mutual, on average, we get mutual information. So pack based bonds are really, in the, in this optimal setting, the optimal priors are um, very related to mutual information bounds. Now can we actually exploit optimal priors? So optimal prior P star depends on the data distribution. And we are faced with this fundamental tension. Pack based prior can depend on data distribution D, but it cannot depend on the data S. And our only handle on the known data distribution is, of course, for the samples that we get. So it seems like it's, you know, it would be really hard to, to take advantage of this, but um, in fact, there are clever ways to get around this. So for example, one approach is uh, using distribution dependent priors and bounding the KL term now in terms of the quantities that do not depend on the data distribution. So there's quite a bit of work on this. An alternative approach is using data dependent priors. So for example, we can use a subset of the data to learn the prior and then use the remainder of the data to evaluate our bound. And Dan and I last year in our um, NURPS, I think, paper, last year we proposed a different idea where we can use all the data to learn the prior distribution, but if we learn it in a differentially private way, we still get a valid pack based bound. So I'll briefly discuss actually both of these approaches in a minute. So let me start with these distribution dependent priors. Um, so Lever et al. in 2010, they study priors and posteriors that take the following form. So the densities of the prior and posterior are exponential, uh, are, are proportional to exponentiated and rescaled risk. And this parameter gamma that appears here is um, called the kind of the inverse temperature parameter. And the, what they show is that the KL divergence between these uh, posterior skew and prior SP can be bounded with high probability in terms of the temperature parameter gamma. 
So now we took the prior that depended on the unknown data distribution, but we get a bound in terms of this temperature parameter instead of the data distribution itself. And then it's quite easy to plug in the, the bound on the KL back to the pack base bound and get a bound on the difference between risk and empirical risk of Q prime in terms of the temperature parameter again. So we evaluated these bounds uh, on, I think this was on MNIST, probably in the fully connected network. Uh, so we, we learned the, these posterior distribution skews in Colangement Dynamics. And the two lines here that are kind of overlapping, this is the train and test error. And on the x-axis, you see the temperature parameter gamma. So as the temperature, inverse temperature, sorry. As the inverse temperature increases, we see that there is a tiny gap now between the test error, which is here the orange line above, and the train error. So the generalization error, which is the green line, you know, it's zero initially, and, and then it starts increasing a little bit as gamma increases, but it even looks like it's decreasing again. So the large inverse temperature parameter, we still barely see any overfitting. If you evaluate lever, sorry, lever generalization bound that I've just presented, you can see that initially it tracks the generalization error pretty well, but as the inverse temperature parameter increases, it starts getting vacuous pretty quickly. And in fact, if you do the same analysis on MNIST with randomized labels, when there is no signal in the data, you can see, of course, that the training and the, the, the training, the test error stays around guessing rate. The training error, you know, initially is guessing for a small inverse temperature parameter, but as that increases, you start overfitting and you can train to pretty much zero, zero classification error. And the, uh, this lever generalization bound that bounds the KL term in terms of the inverse temperature parameter is again starts at zero and then it starts it, it, uh, it closely follows the actual generalization error. So what it tells us that these bounds on the KL divergence that do not use the data distribution itself become, they, they capture really the worst case scenario, so the worst case distribution scenario. And they can become vacuous in the regimes where we do not want them to be vacuous. So lever top bounds are vacuous once gamma parameter is large enough to fit random labels. Now recall that pack based prior P can depend on data distribution, but not the data itself. But data is are only handled on data distribution. So the idea that we proposed last year is that we can use some of the training data itself to, to choose the prior distribution P, but in a way that is stable to changes in the training data. So that the prior would be almost independent of the training data. So the particular technique that we're using is differential privacy. So if you learn the prior in a differentially private way, you still get a valid pack based bound, but now you get this additional penalty term that depends on the differential pri privacy parameter epsilon. So the, le the less differential privacy you have, the more penalty you'll incur because the more you'll be taking from the data in your prior. Now the challenge is that epsilon differential privacy is very hard to achieve. But what we also show is that it's enough to actually be only close in Wasserstein distance to a private mechanism to still get these guarantees. And again, you incur a, a small additional penalty that depends on this Wasserstein distance. There are some new related approaches based on stability. So it, we just saw that there are these numerous approaches for approximating the optimal prior distribution, which is this expectation of QFS analytically with data and with privacy or stability. But is approximating this P star actually optimal? So if you look at the band above, um, you will see that on the left hand side, we evaluate the empirical risk of Q on all of our training data S. And on the right hand side, we divide by M, which is actually just the size of our training data S. What we can do is we could you know, reserve some data S prime, which I'll call from now on prefix data, and evaluate the empirical risk on S not S prime, and divide by a smaller number here instead. What can we do with S prime? With S prime now, we are allowed to learn our prior distribution. So the posterior is still learned on all of the training data S. The only things that change is that we evaluate this empirical risk term on S not S prime, and divide by a smaller number here. So if we only use S not S prime to estimate generalization error, then the optimal prior is this conditional expectation where we condition on the prefix data. 
Now, would we ever want to do this? Is it actually ever better than the usual Oracle priors that I presented initially? And the answer is yes. So that we show that in our recent work. So informally, there is a distribution, loss, and learning algorithm such that a pack-based bond of Oracle prior is vacuous, but the same bound on a subset as not as prime of data-dependent Oracle prior, which is now this conditional expectation, is not vacuous. So with the particular, with a specific example, we design a specific example to show that there are some settings in which case using some of the training data to learn the prior and you know, decrease these terms um, appropriately will do better than just using the prior that depends on the, only the data distribution. So actually data dependence plus data distribution is optimal and does better than just data distribution dependence. So in order to relate Q, this posterior classifier, to GD weights, we need the posterior Q to be tightly concentrated around the weights learned by stochastic gradient descent. And in order to control the kill complexity term, as I mentioned earlier, um, now we use some of the data to approximate these data-dependent oracle priors, this conditional expectation. Now the empirical risk term can be computed on the remaining of the data that the prior never saw, never got to see. How might we approximate this conditional expectation? So consider a Gaussian prior and posterior Q. Center the, the posterior at the HGT solution and let the variance be diagonal. Let the prior be also a Gaussian, center it at some other w, weights W that are now depending on this prefix data, and, have, and let the prior have isotropic covariance matrix. Then the KL divergence between these two Gaussians can be, you know, it's, it's well known, it will be the squared L2 distance between the posterior weights and the prior weights divided by the prior variance plus this extra term, which is the penalty associated to the posterior variance differing from the prior variance. So as I mentioned, we fix posterior mean to be at the HGD solution and we optimize the variance. And we must choose the prior mean before seeing the full data S. So the prior mean, we ideally we would like the prior mean to satisfy this. We want to minimize the expected square distance from the posterior weights conditioning on this prefix data. Stochastic so gradient descent is random, um, and we represent this extra randomness with U, which is coming from the mid-batch order. Now, this randomness is independent of the data itself, right? So we can also condition it when learning the prior. And we take advantage of this. Um, so we want stochastic gradient descent, sorry, we, we want the posterior weights to be equivalent to HGD on the full data set. So we want the posterior weights just to be centered at the usual HGD solution that we get. And since the prefix, it's a subset of all of the training data S, and it's a random subset, we are free to choose S prime to be the first data processed by HGD. So we can take S prime to be kind of the data that HGD accessed for the first iterations or for the first fraction of the epoch. We'll approximate the prior weights by running stochastic gradient descent on the subset S prime to convergence. Now by design, HGD on S prime will match the initial behavior of HGD on S because we're using essentially the same data. So here is a toy example. So here's my, the, the faint blue lines, it's my empirical over surface. I initialize the weights here and I run stochastic gradient descent. I can center the prior to random initialization if I am not using any of the training data. Now, if I allow myself to use a fraction of the training data, and this is a very small fraction, I can couple the first few iterations of SGD running on the full data and SGD running on the prefix data. So they are totally identical. And then I can continue running SGD on this prefix data up to convergence. And I'll end up somewhere here. I'm way closer now in L2 distance than I was before. I can use even a larger fraction of the data to couple. Now the prior matches the posterior run for you know, quite a while, and again I let it run from on the prefix data. Now it's even closer, and even closer if I use more of the data. So this is of course a very toy example. Um, if you go and do the same on MNIST, um, training fully connected to network on MNIST, we actually see that we can predict the weights uh, learned 
on all of the training data by HDD by running HDD on this prefix data itself. So alpha will now refer to the fraction of the training data that we used to learn the prior. So when alpha is 10%, so only 10% of the training data is used to learn the prior, the weights are already quite correlated. At 90%, they're really close, it seems. Now, of course, um, the, the term that appears in the KL divergence between these posteriors and priors is not only the squared L2 distance, but it's also normalized by this effective number of samples. So in our case, you know, one minus alpha times the size of S, which was not, so that's the number of data that was not touched by the prior. And, the KL diver and in the KL divergence, this L2 distance is also rescaled by the prior variance, right? But let's start with the, with the L2 distance. So if you use only the prefix data, we see that using a little bit of the, so on, on the x-axis, it's alpha, the, the fraction of the data used to learn the prior, and on the y-axis is this scale square L2 distance that appears in impact based generalization bounds for Gaussian priors and posteriors. So if you use zero training data, we center our prior trinom initialization, and our distance is quite large. If we start increasing alpha and we use at least a little bit of the training data, we see that the distance really drops dramatically. And that happens on both MNIST, um, a fully connected train, network train on MNIST and Linet 5 train on MNIST. And this is a slightly wider Linet 5 that was used by Zhou et al. Now the dotted line corresponds to using prefix and ghost data. So if you recall, the optimal prior is that conditional expectation. So just using the prefix, we, you know, we allow your, ourselves to learn the prior use, um, based on some of the training data, but the optimal thing to do would be to also have data distribution access, which we do not have. So we, in this case, we split our training data, so all 60,000 examples of feminist in half, and treat half of it as a training data and the second half as ghost data that will help us approximate this oracle prior. So for example, for alpha equals 0.2, we use 20% of the training data and 80% of this ghost data to try to mimic, to predict where GD will land on all of the training data. So we see that um, you know, for fully connected network, using some of the data was, did better. In this case, it's a bit unclear and it seems that initially it did not make a difference and then due to rescaling by a smaller number, it got worse. But one thing that I would like to point out from these plots is that simply using the training data allowed us already to match this prefix and ghost behavior. So just having data-dependent priors allowed us to get very close to these data and data-dependent oracle priors, so data-dependent and distribution-dependent priors, at least in these examples. Now this is just L2 distance rescaled. What appears in the pack base bound is L2 distance divided by the prior variance term. So we also um, evaluated, we did a hyperparameter sweep over the prior variance and evaluated the actual pack base bound one would get. So this is again, um, these results are for training only on half of the MNIS data since we want to lead the other half to approximate these oracle priors. So on the left hand side, it's only using the prefix data. On the right hand side, we learned the prior using both prefix and ghost to get to oracle priors. And we see very similar results. So I won't spend too much time on this, but um, again, using some of the fraction of the data when you only have prefix seem to make a huge difference and less so kind of it's, it's unclear when you only have ghost data. Um, so I'll describe these plots in a little more detail in the next, in the next slide. So here we are dropping the ghost data since in practice we do not have access to the ghost data. We do not have access to Oracle. And we saw that simply having um, this dependence on simply learning the prior and prefix data was already giving us a pretty good estimate of prefix and oracle. So here we evaluate bounds on, on a fully connected network on MNIST, Linet 5 on MNIST, and Fashion MNIST, again Linet 5. So these are the, um, so the, the training process is the following. So just as before, we center the posterior at the weights learned by SGD on all of the training data. And we learn the prior using a fraction of the training data. Again, the fraction is the fraction of the training data that we used to learn the prior is indicated on the x-axis. And the y-axis is our zero one year. So the, these dotted lines 
are the test error or the randomized classifier that you get, so test error of Q, and the solid lines are bounds on the risk. Now, there are different colors here that represent different stopping criteria. So when we train stochastic, um, when we use stochastic gradient descent to learn on all of the training data, we stop at different times. So for example, here we'll stop when we approach 3% of the training error, or here when we approach 0.1% of the training error. So here it's a more overtrained network versus the, uh, this green square, which is a less overtrained network. So what's interesting here, so one thing, of course, we observe kind of the same pattern again. So as we use a little bit of the training data, we can get tighter and tighter risk bounds. So it, it drops quite a bit, especially in these networks. But one interesting thing is here is the dependence on this stopping criteria. So if we stop earlier, which is at this bottom line, we get a much tighter risk bound compared to these two. But if you look now at the test here, the test here is also smaller, which is quite surprising. So not only we got a better risk bound, but we also get a smaller test here. Now, of course, all of these are still very under-trained networks, right? So we are trading off a guarantee here and versus, versus the test here. But it's still quite interesting how the stopping time affects the tightness of the bound and how good our risk is. Now, we've been only dealing with trying to optimize the means of the Gaussians. And we never really did anything clever with the variance. So let's assume that our prior now has non-isotropic but diagonal variance instead, and it's still a Gaussian. How much could an oracle estimate of lambda, the prior variance, help? So we can optimize the KL bound in terms of lambda, and then we obtain that the minimum KL takes the following form. So again, we get coordinate-wise uh, um, squared distance between posterior weights and prior weights, now divided by the posterior variance. Now these bonds, of course, represent the best we could hope to achieve and allows us to test limits of proposed mean prediction. So these are just hypothetical bounds. We are not allowed to optimize the prior variance and we cannot get a valid bound this way, but it's really just testing you know, if we put a lot of effort in trying to better predict the prior variance, how tight are the bounds we could get? And it's very surprising, but actually it didn't seem to help too much. So on the left-hand side, uh, we just have isotropic prior variance, just as before. So we do some hyperparameter sweeps over the prior variance. The prior variance is isotropic, and um, we can you know, it's, it's still, we're still learning what's the best prior variances, but it's easy to account for it via a union bound, and it will be just a small penalty to add. On the right-hand side, we see this optimal prior variance. So when we set the prior variance that is optimal for a given posterior variance, and we optimize the posterior variance as well, using some casting grade in descent. And only, it's even hard to see from this plot, but only for alpha equals zero. So when we don't have any data, training data at all, it, this optimal prior variance helps, but actually the results are very similar. And it seems that even when, you know, when we set this prior variance to be optimal and we are optimizing posterior variance, the posterior variance still remains highly isotropic. Now this might be simply a failure of optimization and it's really hard to draw conclusions from this. Maybe our initialization is just such that we are stuck in some local, local minimum. So as kind of the last quick application, we also apply these same ideas of data dependency and coupling the initial run of HDD rank on all of the data and HDD rank on the prefix data to self-bounded learning. So instead of training, instead of centering the posterior at HDD solution, we start by learning the prior and the prefix data, so we couple the initial run, and now we let uh, the posterior be learned by directly minimizing a pack based bound. So we train, we find the optimal prior, posterior mean and posterior variance. And here we, you know, we, we get very good bounds. So again, using more of the prefix data helps a lot. And these bounds at the end, so again, the solid line is the risk bound and it's bounding the, this uh, randomized classifier test here, which is this randomized classifier risk which is the dashed line. And these are really close, there is barely any difference. So the bonds are extremely tight. And this is, the top is CFAR, then it goes fashion MNIST, um, and MNIST on a couple of different networks. And these are actually very close to even state-of-the-art bounds, but you know, now the question is, uh, what do we actually learn from this, right? 
So it's still interesting, I think, that um, we can get very close to state of the art and get bounds not from held outside, but by doing this coupling and trying to predict the weights. So just to summarize, using fraction of the data, of the training data to predict the GD on, on S, on all of the training data, leads to significant improvement over priors centered at initialization, so our data independent priors. Data dependence leads to predictions approximately as accurate as having fresh Go samples. So those are the plots that I showed that we don't really need this prefix and Go's data, prefix seems to be enough. And theory suggests that this type of data dependent oracle prior may be necessary for tight pack based bounds. At least there are some settings where data dependent oracle bounds do better than just oracle bounds. We are still far from studying KGD itself, of course. Stochastic neural networks in our studies were severely underfit due to looseness of the KL term during pack-based bound optimization. So we need to understand the Pareto optimal frontier. Can we improve on both? Can we improve on the tightness of the bound and the risk term, the, the risk term itself? Now, a study of Gibbs classifiers concentrated near GD weights may be a fruitful testbed for generalization ideas. And I think we'll continue, we'll definitely continue working in this direction because um, I think there is still a lot of space for improvement. Thanks.